hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this lovely event, uh, PRSA Pittsburgh and the Filipino American Association of Pittsburgh in honor of Asian American Pacific Islander uh, Heritage Month. Um, this event is called Be an Actionable Communicator for the AAPI Communities. Uh, we're being very cognizant of same communities because there's so many uh, communities within uh, this identifier. Uh, yeah, and it's very wonderful to be here uh, with these folks up here. Um, just a starter, hi, I'm Alex Grubbs. I am Filipino American. I uh, am an account executive with Batten Hall, which is a UK digital comms agency, but I work remotely here in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh born and raised, and uh, I went to Point Park University for both of my bachelor's and master's degrees. Uh, and yeah, um, I've been on the board of PRSA Pittsburgh since 2019. Uh, I also serve on the DNI committee here, and I'm also the communications officer for the Filipino American Association of Pittsburgh. Uh, today, uh, we have, as I was saying, we have a great lineup of folks within the AAPI communities. We're going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what it means to be an actionable communicator, uh, you know, whether that's you know, more specifically within our PR field uh, or marketing field, or just being a communicator in general. And what does that mean as someone who uh, consumes this type of media when we're walking around uh, kind of pinpointed as the representation when it comes to that? Uh, we'll be co-moderating with my friend and colleague, Mega. Hey, Mega. Hey, how are you? Good, good. If you want to introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, so my name is Mega Pai. I joined the board of PRC Pittsburgh in 2019. I am a content strategist at Pipitone Group, which is an integrated marketing and advertising agency here in Pittsburgh. I was born and raised in central Pennsylvania, but I went out here for college and for grad school. So I'm really excited to be a part of this panel. I'm on the DNI committee with Alex, and I also serve on the communications committee of Paris at Pittsburgh. Um, so let's go over to Sunny. Hey, Sunny. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Sunny Yang. I am Chinese American. Uh, I was not born and raised here. I actually immigrated to the US about 16 years ago from China. Uh, and But Pittsburgh is my home now and I have two beautiful kids here. Um, um, so my day job is of counsel with a law firm called Polarized Morrison Asser LLP. And I focus my practice on international business matters as well as international trade uh, with the US and China focuses. Um, so I'm pretty experienced in negotiating and structuring business transactions, negotiation deals, and also helping corporate executives in matters such as planning for the purchase of US properties by non US persons and things like that. Uh, but outside that, I'm pretty active in several industry organizations and I hold leadership skills in some regional and national bar associations. Um, so I'm an officer and also former board member of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association of Pennsylvania. And I am a member and former chair for the Diversity and Inclusion Community. Uh, community as well as the Asian Authorities Committee, as well as Women in the Law Committee for the LGA County Bar Association. And I was a former executive council member for the um, and vice president and secretary for the Federal Bar Association for the Western Pennsylvania chapter. So we're nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for being here, Sunny. And I know we talked about, you know, if, even if you're a lawyer, Sunny is a strong communicator. I just want to throw that out there. And we're very happy to have you here with us uh, today. Yeah. Yes, uh, we'll go over to Don Michael. Hello, fellow FAAP board member. Hello, hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited for our conversation tonight. Um, so as uh, Alex said, so my name is Don Mike Mendoza. I have one of those double first names. Um, I am DC born and Pittsburgh raised. Um, I did my undergrad and my graduate degrees at American University in Washington, DC. And uh, currently um, I'm the executive director of my production company, Latido Productions, um, that uh, hosts and creates events in DC, New York, LA, and Pittsburgh. Um, and then on the other side of my life, I'm an independent marketing professional where I take clients, whether it be individuals, corporations, or brands, um, and try to help them be better overall, but also um, especially in DEI um, specific matters in terms of messaging, especially with recent events. Um, I also serve on the boards of, like Alex mentioned, the Filipino American Association of Pittsburgh, um, as well as the Filipino American Symphony Orchestra in uh, California. Um, recently, I left my post as the chair of the American University Asian Pacific Islander Alumni Network to join the overall American University the alumni board um, as an at-large member. So if there are any AU alum that are visiting or seeing this event, hi, um, I can help you if you need anything. Um, and then before that, just kind of going through my career, I um, you know, worked in 
I wa wanted to work in broadcasting, but ended up working in PR and marketing, which is why I ended up where I was. But the last real broadcast job I had was working for NPR in DC, um, working with Diane Reem Show and Kojo Namdi. Um, and so here we are in Pittsburgh. So thanks for having me. Yes, thank you so much, Don Mike. I'm very excited to have you here as well. Uh, I know we're talking about this. Uh, Don Michael does amazing things. Sometimes he pops up on CNN Philippines. I just want to throw that out there, just nonchalantly. <laughs> Casually. <laughs> Casually, yeah. And uh, yeah, we also have Prachi. Hey, Prachi, welcome. Hey, it's so good to be here. Um, yeah, I can do a quick intro. So I'm from State College, Pennsylvania, but I did my undergrad at Pitt in anthropology, um, graduated 2019. I've kind of stuck around, um, come back and forth, um, but feel pretty rooted to the city. Um, I'm a communications consultant for two organizations. The first is called the International Water Management Institute. So we do research for development um, across like countries in Asia and Africa. Um, and I focus specifically on migration um, related projects within the organization. And the other organization I work for is called Arise, and that's Pittsburgh based. So we're the Alliance for Refugee Youth Support and Education. So we provide um, programming for youth here in Pittsburgh who come from countries like, um, I think we represent like over 15 countries. Um, and so the, the program that we're working on right now is Prize Academy, which is our summer program. Um, yeah, and the other thing I can mention is I am a co-founder for an organization that started last year in Pittsburgh called South Asians Building Bridges. And our goal for that is really to build, you know, con conversations around race and equity among South Asian communities here in Pittsburgh, as well as, you know, we try to, we hope to work beyond the South Asian community as well. So yeah, very happy to be here. Yes, thank you for being here, Pachi. I know you're saying you're like, I'm just started out in the field, but you have such a stellar resume and definitely, uh, an important person to be in this conversation as well. Uh, thank you, Taylor. Hello and welcome everyone. Again, I want to thank you for taking your time today to have this important conversation regarding, you know, the AAPI communities. Um, just a kind of background before we jump into the discussion of, you know, it's always relevant to talk about this, but increasingly it's become more relevant as the last year has played out, uh, last couple of years, of course. Uh, just to start, you know, from the beginning, um, you know, the Asian population here is not, we're not a monolith of people. There are so many different communities. And it, as you can see here on the board, like you see here, uh, we're all different. We're all represent different stuff, but here we are in solidarity to have, you know, important conversations like this and what that is. Um, just to point out, you know, the Asian population here in the U.S. is one of the fastest growing populations. Uh, Pew Research Center actually did an analysis on the U.S. Census uh, population estimates and since 2010 to 2019, it has increased, you know, from 10.5 million to 18.9 million people and growing, projecting by 2060 that there will be 46 million, uh, you know, Asian identified uh, people here in the U.S. Um, as citizens. And what's really interesting uh, when it comes to it, that it turns out that only 6% right now uh, of people who are considered Asian uh, are you know, represented in our labor force as it is. And if you are native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, it's less than 1%. Um, so there, there's a lot, you know, to dive into when it comes to this, but more importantly, uh, of course, we want to start uh, with talking about the rise in violence towards a, a you know, Asian American Pacific uh, Islander communities. Uh, even to start out, it's not, it's not to say it's not new here, uh, where you have uh, history that seems to be not talked about as much. Uh, from exclusionary acts to uh, internment camps to uh, miscegenation laws. And that means that you, you can't uh, intermix marriage. Uh, and uh, looking at the Pacific front of war that has played out there for over a century, uh, it look, gets looked over when you talk about, oh, you know, stop AAPI hate. Uh, this isn't new. A lot of us have known about this for a while. It's something that we've been experiencing, but it doesn't seem like it comes to light. Um, whether it's reflected in the media, whether it's reflected in our communications. And, you know, a lot of people, especially, you know, Asian immigrants may not feel confident enough to speak up uh, for fear of retribution or uh, anything like that. Um, so recently, you know, the Stop AAPI Hate uh, recorded, uh, reported actually that 3,800 uh, people have been attacked, uh, Asian American Pacific Islander people have been attacked, you know, 2020, 2021. And, 
within a release of that report, a lot of people came, you know, reported additional numbers. So that jumped up to 6,600 by just releasing that within a week of that time. Uh, you know, according to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at uh, Cal State San Bernardino, uh, you know, Asian hate, anti-Asian hate crime uh, reported to the police in like the 16 largest uh, cities here in America have rose 164%. Uh, just in the first quarter of 2021 in comparison to the beginning of 2020 before, you know, the pandemic really kicked off and lockdowns came into place. So, and I, and I know, uh, you know, a lot of people are speaking about it and, you know, you might be talking like, how does this, you know, tie into PR and uh, media and communications, but everything about that is very tied to that. It's a lot of things that people are living with. And I even want to point out too, uh, Sunny, you actually spoke at the you know, at the Atlanta uh, vigil here for the city of Pittsburgh, and you said you felt compelled to speak up. So could you, you know, just walk us through a little bit about, you know, that process of why you felt you needed to speak up. Sure. So thank you for the nice introduction. And you mentioned so much important points. I, I think at that time when I heard about the Atlanta shooting, I just feel like, oh my God, I couldn't believe what happened to, to one extent, but also to another extent, it wasn't so surprising because we kind of have seen that's happening. And just like a family, we see that happen. But um, you know, we, we all know that like, this Atlantic shooting came after a year of increased violence against the Asian American community. Like that was fueled by racism and dysphobia, right? And, and the media, has been trying to portray those victims, those Asian women as like, sexiest and trying to portray them as really to the sex industry, right? What, and so like those women were diminished in the eyes of the public as objects of a sex desire and temptation. So is this especially true considering the where's adult facilities that between the gun stores and the two spas that the shooter passed by. So I just I feel like this is so wrong and a lot of people try didn't really take incident this incident as it should be. It's not because those people should not because they were they do what they do, but because they were Asian, because they were Asian women and things like that, right? So I just feel like I was I actually personally had that kind of experience of being harassed and being attacked, uh, whether harassed or discriminated in the workplace or other places or being physically attacked by other peoples. So um, I'm trying to say, this is probably five, maybe four, four five years ago. Uh, when I was in New, New, New York, um, I was in the train station and trying to catch a train uh, from New York and back to Pittsburgh and, um, and I, I had my suitcase and I was quietly sitting in the Grand Central train station. Um, it was pretty late in, in, late in the evening because I was trying to get back and just to see my family and I try, try to get back as soon as possible. And I was sitting quietly with my suitcase and waiting for the train to arrive. And then a few minutes later, I had a man approach me and he was starting to yell at me, like, go your beach and you, stole my job and go back to China and all those F words and starting to really harassing me. So at that time, the first minute I heard this, I was shocked and I was like, okay, I will be quiet. I don't want this cross travel. So is this person will like step down, right? His temper will come down uh, once he shouted that out. But he initially walked away after he yelled those words and but then he approached me again a few minutes later and again, yelling those words and go back to China and spitting at me and harassing me. And his anger didn't calm down and he, he he's actually, actually continued to escalate and his voice was so angry and hateful. So I was really scared. I was thinking, okay, he's gonna hate me and probably even kill me. And to me, he's like a monster. He was like a guy about 200 pounds, six foot tall, right? And like, if you look at me, I was about like, that's not 100 pounds and five feet tall. There's no way I can be, even if I know Kung Fu, right? I can physically beat this person or do anything. Um, and then I was looking around, Slavia oozing down my cheeks. And I was looking, so is anybody willing to help me and stop this person? But very unfortunately, like nobody even step, said anything. Nobody step up, say, hey, stop this. So I started to run away. I left my suitcase on the on the, on the spot, I started to run in the train station and run to different places and different floors in the, um, 
and this guy was chasing me and following me and I couldn't even stop. My, my heart was pounding so quickly and so heavily because I was so scared. I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna die here and my parents was gonna see my body when they receive a police call and say, oh, your daughter is being attacked. So that's what's wandering my mind at that time. And luckily, I did not die there. Um, I was able to find the police station in the train station as so I ran to him. And the person who was chasing me uh, saw that police officer and started to run away. Um, so I reported that incident to the police officer. And, uh, and I started crying, actually, when I, started, when I saw that police officer, because I was kind of so scared so worrisome, but to also extend, I feel like excited for being able to leave again. And I was trying to explain that to that police officer what happened and the police response that was, was really shocking to me. And he was like, well, you did not actually get injured, right? I, I was like, excuse me? So I feel like, do I have to be really bleeding or being in hospital before you are going to do anything? I just like, I just feel like, this thing appears to be really trivial to them. Like, while it is super important to me, I just feel like it changed my perception. Um, at that time, like in a rush to get back to Pittsburgh, I, I did not press that harder. And I, would, I was just thinking, if I keep that quiet and do not share it out, and it's going to pass, right? Like the sky is going to pass, it's, I will get healed. But then I heard about this athletic shooting and I have heard about all those other incidents. I just feel like I, I feel like I can't stay quiet anymore. And I feel very bad about not being pushed further at that time, just because I feel, well, maybe the same person who attacked me attacked some of the other AAPIs in New York or did something else. I just feel really, really bad. And so every time I look back upon it, I regret I did not speak out. I did not push that further, even though like I mean, it was really challenging. Even if I was an attorney, I was trying to push the police to do something, right? And it was really challenging um, when they just feel like so, so determined, like this is that matter, I'm not doing anything. Um, like they are not gonna be, like, even if they do anything, this person is not gonna be prosecuted or something because you did not get injured. But that feeling was just so bad. So at that video, I heard about that. As I just reached out to some friends, uh, starting to talking to Welcome in Pittsburgh and United Chinese Americans and other associations. I just feel like we need to do something here. We need to take actions. We can no longer stay quiet and just like hopefully something gonna happen. If we wish something to happen, if we if we wish something to be changed, we have to change. We have to stand up, speak for ourselves. And if only if we speak out, other people is going to hear our voice and will be support us and speak out for our behalf. So that's why I just feel at that time, I just feel I am so compelled. Like I have to do something. Right, and that's such a horrible experience. Yeah. And I feel when you go through that, Kind of trauma it's hard to speak up for yourself right after that because you want people like the police and other people in authority to protect you yeah. you know like it shouldn't be on you to fight but i feel like so often for so many people in the asian community we experience all this hate and we internalize it and it's minimized by other groups sometimes and people say oh you know it's no big deal you weren't actually hurt but these experiences are important to vocalize because you can save other people from going through the same fate and i think alex did you have a point to that yeah, I mean, again, Sunny, thank you so much for being vulnerable and sharing that story with us. Uh, yeah, I mean, my point that I wanted to make with that is, you know, things like that, where, you know, people come on the street uh, and say this stuff to you is always fueled by the type of communications that go around, uh, you know, Asian people. When you watch television and you see that these characters, uh, you know, are these false stereotypes that are placed and on us and especially women, you know, especially Asian women in this uh, specific conversation. Um, that, that's what happens. And then these words, they don't sound like, you know, for a lot of people, they may not think it's bad, but it's just in the process of dehumanizing. And how do we shift that language as, you know, writers? How do we amplify stories like yours, Sunny? Uh, and I think it's, ve it's very important that we need to highlight that uh, one. And then it's across the board. How are we reporting this? Uh, you know, how some of the language, uh, when you hear, uh, you know, 
this type of rhetoric where it's like, oh, you know, the China virus, or you hear the type of rhetoric, oh, we're in competition with this country. Um, for a lot of people, people take that and use that as a way to dehumanize people and then go straight forward in doing what, you know, they're going to do in a racist attack or something like that. And then unfortunately ends up in people dying, uh, which we have seen and increase it. Uh, and that, that's the type of, you know, language that we need to shift, you know, when it comes to communications. Like how do we, you know, tell these stories authentically while also not perpetuating the stereotypes and biases on these people that allow people to take that and run with it to, you know, cause harm for other people. Yeah. Uh, Prachi, did you want to weigh in on that as well? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Sunny, something I was struck by is you were talking about, you know, why it's so important and so powerful for us to speak out and like, you know, talk about the things that we've been through. But I'm also thinking about like how there's so much like almost pressure placed on the person or the victim, whoever is experiencing this to be the advocate, to be the person who's like speaking out, to be the person who's raising awareness. And um, yeah, I'm thinking about like, um, you know, what you just said about like the role of media, right? Because I think like that is a direct link, right? So if the media is able to, you know, create space for these voices to, to you know, take up space, um, it allows for more like structural change to take place rather than like individual activism. So I think, yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. And also just in terms of like how we can do communications, which, um, you know, is more inclusive, something that like I care about a lot is like participatory storytelling. So like, how can we do communications where we include like the communities that we're telling stories about and instead of someone going into a community and just like doing some, you know, photo taking or writing, which sometimes can be a little bit extractive, like ways to work with communities that allow for like long-term sustained stories to come out. Um, so I'm you know, always curious to see how we can facilitate things like that within organizations. Yeah, yeah, Prachi, I feel like that's a really good point. Like not just telling other people's stories, but making them the part of the story and allowing them to like speak and tell it on their own behalf. But um, John, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I feel like it's, you know, this, uh, speaking up is very important and it's very hard for us because culturally we don't do that. You know, exactly what Sunny was saying, like she would hope the person would go away and just it would be done and just not cause trouble. And I think that's something that we all have ingrained in our, our cultural identities because of, you know, whether we're the immigrant or our parents are the immigrant or our grandparents, it's just something that is pervasive with us. And so we're not used to speaking out. And so it's really encouraging to see our communities be inspired by other communities of color speaking up and getting involved um, in terms of not only supporting them, but also then in turn supporting ourselves. Um, on, on my side of things, you know, where I've noticed in terms of um, hateful events, and which is the most unfortunate thing is that the targets tend to be women and it's really, really upsetting. And so for me, I have a lot of uh, female members of my family who are all older. Um, the youngest one is my mom and she's over 60. And so um, when all this started happening, I, you know, my kind of reaction to all of it was I became very paranoid. I mean, very like worried about where my female family members were going um, and, you know, where I just didn't feel comfortable, like even sending my mom to the store down the street, because like, what if on her walk there and back, which is all of like three blocks, you know, some person leaps out at her and attacks her and she's, you know, 63, she can't do anything about that usually. So, you know, I think in terms of my activism with what's going on here, it's, you um, you know, not only like physically protecting people by like going with them to places, you know, it's also just in trying to speak out to inspire others to do the same in their communities. You know, I thought it was really interesting to see, especially in the, the Bay Area um, and Chinatown in New York too, where younger people were stepping up to accompany older people um, to where they were going or just, you know, silently follow behind them, you know, if they saw somebody alone in the street, just in case. So, you know, there's all, there's many, many things you can do. And sometimes it doesn't even involve speaking up. It involves just, you know, being a presence. Um, so, but hopefully, you know, we're, we're making progress, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely a great point. Um, I feel like we can all support each other and lift each other up just by like being there, listening, you know, helping an older person across the street, just all of those things 
really help. And that's one of the unifying things of all the different Asian communities. That's a way that we can come together because we're not a monolith as Alex can mm -hmm. dive into more. Yeah, I mean, this is good segue, just, you know, navigating the workplace and even, you know, being communicators, we're also, we're coworkers too. We're here with these people. How do we support, uh, you know, our fellow coworkers? I, I feel, you know, a lot of people may not even realize that, you know, if there are coworkers with us, they don't realize that we're going through this. We, we have these anxieties, these fears. And I know, Sonny, you brought up the other day that, you know, even with work, people going back to work, there's that fear of when you go to work, are you going to be attacked on the street? And you want to be at work and, you know, even, even with being vaccinated, everything's going back to normal, but you really have to be wary of that because anything could happen on that. But, you know, even going into the workplace, you know, in the U.S., the labor force here, about 6% are considered, you know, Asian, uh, within, and less than 1% again for Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. And that's across the board. Uh, prevalent in the communications industry, uh, marketing managers, about 7.6%. News analysts, 6.7, writers, 4.3, and the list just goes down uh, within public relations, advertising, and even Sunny, since you know we wanted to highlight you too, only 5% are lawyers. So who are gonna represent these people uh, when they're you know going through things like this? Um, and it's definitely something to you know think about. Um, you know, a lot of studies don't really highlight, uh, you know what Asian community or populations being represented at the workplace to begin with. It's easy to say 6% is Asian, but there's so many different communities uh, all kind of bunched together. And there, there's been a call within the AAPI community for data disaggregation. And basically it's breaking down what these statistics are and recognizing which uh, you know, communities are people that aren't being represented in between the cracks because you know, what's going on in the Filipino community for Don, Mike and I could be significantly different for the Chinese community with Sunny and even in the Indian community with Prachi and Mega. And how can we really get to, down to these issues when we're all painted as one? And I think that's where some of this, you know, goes in. Like, we're talking about Asians not a monolith. How, how has this affected, you know, any of you? I, I'd like to hear around. Don, Mike, we could start with you. How has that affected you? Sure. Um, I think it, in terms of my work and what I do, um, you know, being a producer, there's a lot of decisions that I get to make um, in terms of representation. And the media, as we said earlier, is a big player in what's happening um, in terms of what's covered, what's not, what's talked about, what's ignored. Um, and so with, with my work and with, uh, which is mostly in the entertainment industry, you know, I really push hard to make sure that we have genuine, genuine um, depictions of people and their culture and their ethnicity or nationality, you know, um, to make sure that it's not only accurately told, but as much as possible told by a person from that um, community, which is exactly what Prachi was talking about. Um, you know, I think the days of, of, observative, if that's even a word, observe, observation, um, cultural storytelling is, is kind of over, you know, like it, there's really no excuse to say, well, I couldn't find a Filipino person to tell their story, or like, I couldn't find, you know, a Chinese person or a South Asian person. Um, you know, it's just that effort. And I'm seeing a lot of that changing. And specifically speaking, um, let's talk about the Broadway community. Um, Broadway's reopening in September, but the um, entire industry has a lot of very well-known um, AAPI people, um, along with other people of color, BIPOC, LGBTQ+, who are saying, we refuse to go back to work until Broadway becomes actually equitable, or like, we refuse to go back into the show until roles actually make sense for people, um, because there's a whole movement called We See You American Theater, um, and it's, it's calling out all the production companies, all the Broadway companies, for how just... Um, really racist um, that industry is. And that's just one of the many facets of entertainment. And so for me personally, when I go into my work, you know, if even if I'm producing a concert, you know, I make sure that people are represented across the board. If it's a concert about, um, let's see, one that I did a few years back was, um, it was an Asian American Heritage Month um, event. And it was, you know, inviting people to, um, who were AAPI identifying to participate in this concert. Um, and so that was just a really great platform to say, hey, here are people who identify, listen to their stories and see them perform. Um, 
to also down the road provide equity in the industry where producers in and at that time Washington DC couldn't say I didn't know where to find AAPI people for this job um, because the the really big um, kind of scandal within the entertainment industry and producing is whitewashing um, you know whitewashing people's stories and so that's how you end up with things like Asian hate where people believe that it's actually a white narrative when actually it's not. It's something that came from um, our communities. Um, and I would say the most ridiculous example was um, when a friend of mine was cast in The Little Mermaid as like the national tour, Little Mermaid live tour. She was Ariel and she's Japanese American, um, adopted by American parents. But um, there was a huge scandal and it's like newsworthy scandal that people were upset that it was an Asian person playing Ariel because Ariel is supposed to be white. And it's like, you guys, it's a freaking mermaid. Like mermaids don't have a nationality. So, um, you know, it's really, at least on my end, really making sure that um, I hire accurately, I tell stories accurately and that things make sense. Um, and and also including that community, like Prachi was saying, it's like you, you, you cannot ignore the community that you... Um, are, are talking about our storytelling about. There's another scandal I'll talk about that I brought up in our chat the last time we all talked, but we'll, we'll get there later. It has to do with the food industry. But anyway, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I think especially for little girls, it's important for them to see, you know, mermaids of different th ethnicities, even though mermaids technically don't have an ethnicity, because just growing up, mm -hmm. You know, you look at all these Disney characters and Disney has started to sort of diversify their cartoons a little bit now. When you're growing up in the 90s, you didn't really see that. So it's just mm -hmm. nice to have more representation in those spaces, even if it's, you know, fictional spaces, because that's what kids are growing up and looking at. And it's good to see yourself represented. Um, Crouchy, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, what this brought up for me is I was thinking about in terms of the workplace, like how easy it can be for like tokenism to take place if there aren't like too many folks who, you know, represent where you're from in that space. I mean, I can say from my personal experience, I've been pretty like grateful in terms of like both of the organizations I work for. One is very international and the other one is very like, I struggle with the word diversity sometimes, but it's very diverse and in terms of like, there's a lot of people represented from different backgrounds. Um, but just from personal experiences, like I think it's so easy for one to be tokenized when there just isn't a lot of representation um, in terms of like, you know, I come from an Indian background. So maybe being asked to like represent like Hinduism, whereas like I wouldn't really say I'm like the go to authority on that, you know, um, but it also makes me think about like privilege in terms of how, you know, Asians aren't a monolith. Um, and I can speak from at least a South Asian perspective, like South Asians aren't a monolith either. And like, I hold a, a lot of privilege in that like I'm North Indian. And I think that the dominant image of like South Asia is like North Indian culture. Um, and so, yeah, being mindful of, you know, personal privilege, but also like how tokenism can take place and, you know, ask individual people to speak for an entire like culture or religion or background or worldview, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And I definitely experienced that too, where people ask me to explain Hinduism and I can't explain, you know, thousands of years of a religion and just um, coming from a family, we're all from South India, South Indian um, cuisine and South Indian culture is not as represented or known. So a lot of people just don't really know the duality of like North versus South or East versus West and just all of the languages that there are in India, there are so many. So really like within South Asia, there's diversity, but even within the same country, there's a lot of different things going on. Um, and Alex, I think he said something the last time we spoke about the Philippines and how there's a lot of different um, cultures going on there as well. Yeah, I mean, it's the same with, you know, Asian is not a monolith, Filipino is not a monolith either. And, you know, just saying stuff like this, like Don, Michael and I are from the same community and we look extremely different. Yeah. And you know, in the US and in the Philippines, it, it means so much, you know, you know, it means so much depending where you're at. But even there, there's so many different languages, there's so many different, you know, cultures within it. Um, and if you want to go through the lens of just colonialism, because that's something, you know, the Philippines had to deal with from Spain and then the US. Um, basically, in like, in 
the most basic way to say it, it's they found all these islands in the Pacific and kind of grouped them together. Um, it's even when they had a bunch of different cultures going on within that. And then they're like, oh, name after the you know, king of Spain, here's the Philippines. And so what is that? Uh, and what have you find an identity? Not a lot of people know about this stuff. Um, you know, and especially here in the US, you know, when it comes to representation, and this goes back to writing, and this goes back to communications, mm -hmm. uh, I learned almost nothing about the Filipino American, the Philippine American War, of how they got colonized in the first place. I knew nothing about the revolution against Spain. I knew nothing about some of the stuff that happened here. Uh, you know, the miscegenation laws over on the West Coast, where you know Filipino men couldn't marry white women uh, because that became a thing. There were riots, the Watsonville riots, because of it. Um, even when it comes to stories like even in the Bay Area, there's a specific air, uh, hotel that many you know older Filipinos lived in, but the government was taking it back from eminent domain. And you don't hear the stories of, hey, the Black Panther Party was there standing in solidarity with them while protesting outside about it. And it's things like that where it makes you question, you know, who am I? Like, what, what does actually, you know, what does this mean when I'm here in this Western contextual setting? Um, why hasn't this story been told? Why am I not aware of it? And you know, bulk of the you know Asian population in the U.S. is more predominantly West Coast. So you know where we're at here specifically, it's a very uh, even the South, even the South has more you know Asian diversity than the North actually in the breakdown you know provided by Pew Research Center. Um, it, there isn't representation, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in media, and all the ways. And I would even say too, I think. You know, when you have these Asian roles, and this kind of goes back into, we had this conversation about Crazy Rotations, which amazing movie, you know, we all loved it, but what, what a lot of people don't realize and what I felt that movie was perpetuating, even though it got amazing reviews, everyone loved it, it was Asian representation, here we go. Um, this, a lot of the actors weren't even Chinese, even though it was a Chinese narrative. Um, and we kind of got in this conversation where it's like, oh, you know, the main actor, he's half British, half Malaysian. And it's not to take away from his Asian identity, but it was he the best person to represent that community. Um, and it goes across the board on that. And we talk about the Filipino actor, Nico Santos. He was the poor cousin. Uh, what kind of message is that saying when you have a brown Asian person as the poor cousin? Uh, you know, it's kind of like fueling these narratives that people could take and, you know, just roll with it with, you know, what they're going uh, through. And it's just these type of questions. We, we need to have more communications when it comes to that. Uh, whether, you know, it's writing, whether it's media representation, whether it's, you know, if you're in PR too, and this is kind of the focus, what kind of influences are you activating? You know what I mean? I, I kind of ran into this situation before where it's like, oh, we can't find any Asian American uh, people. And I'm like, I literally could just like list off bunch of people off my like head. And I'll even bring up, you know, status. Uh, there's a report by status and it's about 3000 people, but there's 95% confidence in it. Uh, only 42% uh, of people couldn't name a well-known Asian at all in the US. Um, and many who have like did name was, you know, Jackie Chan, which he hasn't really been in any films in over a decade. Uh, Bruce Lee, and he died decades ago. Uh, Lucy Liu, she's a little bit more prominent, maybe more in the early, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, and then Connie Chung. Um, but there's so many more diverse talent for that. And even when people are aware that our vice president is of Asian descent as well, only 2% named her. So it's kind of like shifting that narrative, hey, we're here, uh, you know, and we're here to, you know, be here and stay. And again, these stereotypes get played into it. And I know, Sunny, you brought this up, uh, you know, stereotype of being, you know, there's a stereotype specifically for Asian women that they have to be quiet, timid, uh, and, you know, just go with the flow. But, you know, when you were in the workplace, you brought up that you were just speaking up and people were kind of taken aback by that. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. It, it's generally like people have this expectation or stereotype, right? Like people, Asian women, you have to act certain way and you have to be quiet and you you are very modest and you don't brag about yourself. You don't speak up for any opinions. And even if you have disagreements, you should be like quite defending that people sharing opinions and you, you don't want to speak up in a board meeting or conference, things like that. And so sometimes when I do speak up, I just feel like I 
like I was saying, like I was compelled, like I have to say something, and people were just like, kind of shocked when they wait. Did the person just spoke up? And some, so sometimes you just feel like, oh, this is kind of backfire because of this stereotype. Um, when you do speak up, because you do not fit certain stereotype, because people don't expect you to act certain way. So that's very challenging sometimes. I just feel adds additional burden to people in the AIPA community that they want to change the stereotype, but people like is pushing back, right? Or just adding additional stress or burden on a person when these people try to do the right thing by, by speaking up, by sharing it, by correcting those kind of implicit bias or correcting those stereotype thinking. And as, as an attorney in my workplace, because of my, because of my Chinese background and I spent decades in China too, I always ask being asked this question, like, oh, what does people, how will people react to this? If I make this argument, what other people is gonna think? And I was like, I, I don't know. Like, every people is different. If you make the settlement offer, I can't guarantee the other side is going to accept just because I'm Chinese and I have a Chinese, Chinese background, I can predict uh, how this company is going to react, right? With this negotiation techniques, with, with this or that. But I always, always get to ask this question, how does Chinese people gonna react to this? And, uh, and as we were saying, Chinese is not anonymous, it's easier. Like we are really diverse in terms of food, in terms of cultures, it's a huge geography and it had, it's very different. And, and also each person is different. They, have, they all came from different background, they have different upgrowing. So it's, it's really difficult to say, okay, just because this is a Chinese company we're dealing with is as a clan or at the other side, they are going to react this way or that way, right? I just feel that people have to realize that and changing the stereotype. It's thinking this person as a person, thinking this person is company is a company, just think people not as an object, but as a human being. Uh, that's, I think that's really the way to go, so. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, did you wanna, sorry, Megan, did you wanna to add to that? Um, yeah, I was just gonna say, those are all excellent points. And I think that kind of gets down to the heart of everything that we're talking about. Like Asians and Pacific Islanders are people too. And it seems like an obvious statement, but it's just, with all of the stereotypes floating around and with all the portrayals of the media, it's something that I think people might take for granted or subconsciously not recognize because you're seeing these stereotypes so much, you don't realize that, oh, you know, everyone's a person and you should get to know them on that level as well. And you can appreciate someone else's culture, but you don't need to distill them to their cultural identifier or their race um, or things like that. And then there are people like Alex who are multi-ethnic and multiracial so um, yeah. I had to talk more about that. I mean, yeah, I mean, going into that, just as it is, like I kind of, how I walk my life, you know, here being multiracial in this perspective is, you know, culturally and ethnically, I'm more like Don Michael. Uh, lineage wise, my grandmother uh, and my great grandfather is more like Prachi and Mega. And then I walk this life with my mother because my mother happens to be lighter skin, uh, you know, I walk, we walk this life, you know, similar to Sunny. Uh, so what does that mean, you know, navigating through that? And people don't realize that we're here. There's stories of people like that too. And I think, you know, from the multicultural, you know, multiracial perspective, a lot of those stories, you know, are thrown under the rug. And I'm going to speak specifically from the Filipino community, but you see people, uh, you know, Filipino actors who may be half or a you know, quarter, or whatever, like me, but they're never written for a Filipino role specifically. It's not being represented at all. Um, and you know, the media doesn't really, media advertising doesn't really highlight that. In the Philippines, they might highlight the hell out of it. Um, but when it comes to the US, <laughs> you know, that's not brought up. And I'm bringing this up like someone like Vanessa Hudgens, she's half Filipino, people wouldn't know that. Um, you know, Darren Chris, he's half Filipino. And then you got people like Bruno Mars, you have people like, um, what is it? Yeah, Nicole Scherzinger. There's so many people that are part of it, but people don't realize uh, because they, you know, because to them, all of a sudden they're racially ambiguous or they're white. And it's just like, they don't live life like that realistically. And just, you know, putting that stereotype and expecting that, it's just like, it's what, like that diminishes who that person is. 
and what they stand for, what they're about. And actually got in a little conversation about Olivia Rodrigo, because uh, she's been, you know, coming, you know, high, uh, higher up in, you know, fame here in the US. Um, and I really, it struck me when I've seen debates, you know, whether she was Filipino or not. And I'm like, her dad's Filipino, her grandfather's Filipino, her great grandfather's Filipino, she has a whole Filipino side. So who are people who are part of the community to be here up for the debate whether she's Filipino or not, you know? Uh, and I think that's what's played out. There's not enough representation when it comes to that. And to me and Don Michael, we could probably look at her and be like, oh yeah, she's Filipino. She got <laughs> Filipino last name. She looks like Catriona Gray a little bit. Like she looks like, you know, someone that'd be represented. But there is that argument too. And, and this goes across, like when it comes to Asian, you know, representation, where there's not enough brown, uh, you know, Asian representation across the board. Uh, and that's a conversation that, it's been becoming more prevalent nowadays because especially again, I bring up this like, you know, crazy rich Asians, cool, you know, is this supposed to be encompassing of all Asians? Because not all Asians look like that uh, specifically. And it's even issues when you go back to the country because with a lot of, um, you know, colorism that plays out there, it, play, it gets played out again too. So, you know, people, a lot of people aren't aware that, you know, we're living that life. Uh, you know, not just someone as multiracial, but just in general, this is what's happening to a lot of people. We're not being represented at all. <laughs> and if we are, it's very either we're whitewashed out, that's one, or two, um, it's we're placed on these stereotypes. And, you know, when you hear an accent, all of a sudden you think they're not educated or anything like that, which I think to me that we need to shift the narrative to, because just because if you have an accent doesn't mean you're not you know, fluent in multiple languages, you got all these degrees, and people are quick to tell you, oh, you don't sound American, but who are you to judge when, you know, I might be successful as hell, you know what I mean? Um, and I really like erases what we're going through. Um, and not even just that, I, this might be a really good segue in talking a little bit about the model minority men. I think that's another thing. Um, and this is what happens when a lot of us speak up towards these issues uh, within our community, because this is not talked about a lot. Uh, we are put on this pedestal that we're like you're the best minority people. When you see an Asian person, they're hardworking, they're ready to go, they lay low, they don't do anything. And I think that's even more detrimental because it doesn't really uh, encompass, you know, what people are dealing with. Just because some Asian people have gone on and been successful, you know what I mean? It might be in some of these C-suite roles. Um, that doesn't mean that there's a whole population of people uh, within any part of the community uh, are, you know, suffering. And, you know, what we see these rise in attacks on, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander people, most of the time these people are working class, you know, immigrants, or they're just working class Americans, more rather. And, you know, that narrative isn't being told at all. And, you know, what can we do from the perspective of pushing that out and making sure these stories are heard so people know this? Um, because it's getting thrown you know, it's getting thrown under the rug. And then when you speak up about, about it, you're like, well, you didn't get attacked and things like that. Uh, and Mega, I know you wanted to add point to that. Yeah, yeah, just with the model minority myth, I don't know how many times people say, oh, you know, you're Asian, you're good at math, or just kind of things like that that are not okay, but people, you know, see those stereotypes and communications and they just kind of say it as if it's a given in life. And like, personally, I hate math. That's part of the reason why I went into a writing focused career, but um, I just feel like people need to be cognizant of the fact that everyone has different skills and abilities and you can't just kind of group a set of characteristics onto all Asians and be like, all Asians know this or that. And uh, Sunny, you're making some good points the other day, kind of related to that, if you wanted to dive into that a little bit more. Yeah, so I actually just wanted to throw in here too, because I, when we're talking about this model minority myth as well as the stereotypes, I think it's really hurting the Asian people. Because when we were talking about diversity and inclusion, I have to say AKPI people is really or often not really the target, right, of the of the target group when you are trying to talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, because we're thinking, oh, they are doing really well, they have this model minority miss, it don't really need additional help, right? But we actually have hundreds of years of, of history of being discriminated being excluded, being 
forbidden to get together with people's husband. Like women were not allowed to join the, their husband in the US under the Page Act for hundreds of years. Give women women a long citizen spouse, they will lose their citizenship. It has been going on for decades and decades. So we have hundreds of years of this history. Nobody talks about it. And I would have to say, most of the people don't even know about it, right? And we have, we know a lot, of, a lot of other minority groups, they are really suffering. We definitely acknowledge the problem, but at least their history is well known, right? And people know there's a strong history there. And what is struggling me about this model minority myth is like, now, nobody even talk about this Asian history of being excluded. Nobody knows about it. And everybody's under this myth thinking, oh, this is, your group is doing really well. It don't need additional help. We don't have to think about you when we were thinking about that word state inclusion because we know other community has problems. So this is really troublesome to me. Um, I mean, personally, as it's, even if you're doing well, you feel really, really lonely in, in a workplace, right? As you may be the only Asian people in that company, or maybe the only Asian people in that building. And frankly, sometimes when I was working in my, in my building and I walked down, if I see another Asian face, I got very excited for that day because it could be like a whole month or maybe two months. I do not see any Asian face in the whole building I'm working in, oh, in the whole company. So, so it's a really naughty feeling and, and I don't really want to be taken at work as like, oh, she's an attorney with Chinese background, but I was rather being considered, oh, she's an excellent attorney in doing international trade or international business, right? I, I don't just want to be labeled that. Like, so I think this model minority is really hurtful as well because well, while some attorneys doing okay, I mean, I'm more familiar with a legal field, right? So I, I was saying only, like only 5% in the legal field are Asian. And probably less than 1% make it to the middle level. Um, and even smaller, I would say probably 0.1% or something like that, make it to the pattern level. So I think Asian generally, they have a really challenging time trying to make it to the management, to the leadership too. So they probably will make it okay at the entry level and some of them would make it to the mid-level management, but you will very rarely see people making to the leadership level because they will be thinking, oh, Asians, they are, oh, what's the right word? Technically proficient, but socially deficient. Right, that's, that's a lot of time people describe you with that. Uh, Asian people, they don't have communication skills. They don't have leadership skills. And so that's, and, and oftentimes they don't really given the opportunity to develop those skills too. And they don't give an opportunity to even to try to take on those things just to prove that, right? I, and I just feel like if we're going to go forward and speak up and change this stereotype, I think this, this issue definitely needs to be spoken up more often and need to be addressed. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I agree 100%. And I'll just quickly like jump in and stuff, you know, you know, Taylor uh, Fife, you know, our d &I chair wrote about being the only, you know, black woman in the place. But for a lot of us too, we're the only Asians in the place. I, I will say this from the perspective of basically until my current job right now, almost every job I have worked or every educational background I've been in, I've been the one of like only or the only you know Asian person in the room, uh, and that's incredibly what like what, and then people again they push this stuff on you and they'll be like oh you're a hard worker and you do all this and all that and I'm like no like let's back up real quick it's just like now I feel the pressure that I have to be the representative of how many people with cultures because I'm the only one in the room and I'm the one that can grab it and you feel this pressure that you have to perform the best because if you don't then all of a sudden you're gonna get you know reprimanded for it or something like that and it's definitely something I you know have been finding myself and navigating through but now it's like you know I work with some of my colleagues who happen to be Asian or they're multiracial Asian I'm like wow like I've never really experienced that um and I think that happens to a lot of people uh, Don Michael you wanted to add to this 
I feel like it goes back, and this is like three points ago, but um, starting with media, but into what Sunny was talking about and all of that, it's just that it's the idea of gatekeepers. Um, there are gatekeepers in every industry and in every office and every corporation that we're trying to be part of, and the, and the gatekeepers don't value us. So professionally communication speaking in terms of marketing, we do a lot of surveys. Um, I've seen a lot of surveys in the university level that do DEI measurements. And when they do that, they say black and Latino. They don't talk about Asians. When you talk about a university like where I went to, like American, where I would say the largest minority is Asian because they don't count international students into their DEI study. And like the largest international student group is from Asia. So, you know, and then in terms of entertainment, you know, the gatekeepers are the producers. You look at Crazy Rich Asians and you look deeper and you look at the producers of that movie and usually they're white people. And so they're like, well, they want to tell the story of successful light-skinned Asian people because it makes them feel comfortable. You know, like at the end of the day, producers are the visionaries. So I think one solution that we're kind of running into to this that's kind of helping us speak out um, is actually weirdly enough social media. Um, you know, in the past, people to get message out there had to de had to depend on PR managers, had to deal uh, depend on agencies to put a message out there um, or talk to um, a booker at a news station. But now that social media exists, exists, um, we have the power. We can set up our own brand. We can set up our own messaging and put out what we want um, for people to see. And hopefully it catches on and kind of circumventing those people that cut, cut off the content that needs to go into media. So in, essentially in the last 15 to 20 years, there's now been a reversal. News stations, newspapers, they're all watching social media to see what's viral and what's important um, to talk about. So unfortunately, you know, with Asian hate, you know, there has to be a lot of social media traction for a news company like CNN to to pay attention to it. But it, but it is hopeful because we can we can lean on that. We know that we can shout as loud as we can, and we have a platform to do it that's free. That we don't have to go through the lens of these people that um, are preventing us from getting our our message out there. And so I think collectively, you know, the more we share, the more we speak, the more we talk about what happens to us um, and the people we work with and the organizations we're starting, um, you know, I think the more leverage we'll have um, to kind of burst past those gatekeepers um, and and get and get change to happen. So, um, but yeah, I wouldn't say like, it really is that, especially in, in branding, you know, you don't have to go through an agency to brand your brand anymore. So you don't have to hear a person who's not like you say that you, that the brand you're bringing to the table is not good enough. Um, you can do it yourself. And so I think that on the flip side, it's now companies' responsibilities to present that work. You know, so if you approach an agency and say, I want you to, to market my brand, it's, it's there, it's now their responsibility to say, we're going to do the research to make sure that we do this correctly. You know, we're going to make sure that we do that because then you don't end up with terrible marketing campaigns that go past all these folks. And then it goes public and everyone's like, who said yes to this? For example, Dove Soap, where they, um, literally whitewashed a black woman to be a lighter skinned black woman using Dove products. So, which is pervasive as Alex knows in Filipino culture, skin whitening, huge deal. And so, um, you know, fighting that we can do that through, through these means. So, um, but there's, there's a lot to be said about who makes the decisions. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think in agencies too, it's definitely good if, you know, across the board, across the country, agencies are hiring more diverse uh, mm -hmm. people and having a more diverse workforce so that we can help be the people who speak up uh, when those decisions are being made. And Prachi, uh, would you like to add anything about decision makers? Yeah, actually, I wanted to circle back a little bit because we were talking about the model minority myth and oh. yeah, and also like stereotypes. And something I wanted to say is, you know, I think we just highlighted how stereotypes can be painful, but I also wanted to add like how powerful it can be when stereotypes are broken. So something that I'm thinking about, like an example that popped into my head, if anyone's heard of it or seen it, the show Never Have I Ever by like Mindy Kaling. Yeah, yeah like it. something about that show is like, I would say dominant stereotypes for like South Asian women have been kind of like, yeah, like maybe more submissive or quieter, um, but that, and also like North Indian usually, right? Um, and this was interesting because it's, you know, 
an Indian or like a South Asian Tamil character, right? So like there's not a lot of Tamil representation in media, I would say, especially in America. Mm -hmm. um, and she's like outspoken and she's talking about her sexuality. And like, those are things that would never be discussed, I think, you know, when I was growing up by a South Asian female character. So, you know, it's really powerful. And I, I just am thinking about what that must do for young, young people today. Um, but also in terms of the model minority myth, like, thank you, Sunny, for like beautifully explaining like how it is so harmful to Asian communities. Um, but I'm also thinking about like how it makes it easy for Asian communities to be like complicit sometimes, like particularly like Asian folks who kind of hold more power in the model minority myth. It's so easy for us to just kind of, you know, think that, oh, we are just better. Like we are not like the other people here, you know? Um, and like recognizing that, I think that we, you know, there's nothing that's actually like better per se. It's it's more like a structure that's been placed on us um, that actually hurts us sometimes um, is important. And I, that's kind of actually why like the organization I mentioned, South Asians Building Bridges, that's kind of how we came to this because we were thinking about like, what is the South Asian community doing for, um, you know, the African-American, the black community during, you know, this time of racial reckoning? And we realized like maybe not much, like, you know, there's maybe not too many conversations going on. So I think that that duality is really there in the model minority myth. Yeah, I just want to echo what everybody was saying, especially what Pratchett was saying, like this model minority myth is trying to turn us against them. It's like, it's really trying to turn out it's us or them, or like us doing well, who are those that are doing poorly or, or like turning, AAPI groups against each other or taking AAPI groups against other minorities, right? Because it really was thinking, okay, we are doing better than others. So it, it, it's just really, really bad. And I think just it's a, I mean, it, this min, model minority myth was really not in place until the 1980s or something like that, because historically, like Asians were doing really, really bad, right? Like we, we know like, they haven't been even, even allowed to participate and do, in the society, but, but just because I, in the eighties, the Asians starting to do well, they created this myth, model minority myth, and making people to believe, okay, I have achieved something, so now I'm different from the other minority groups who are struggling, and but uh, it is just really bad. I think it has to be broken. Um, and I also like the fact that, uh, like down like these producer groups and actors, and I know there's a lot of Asian actors that have been very active and as well as very vocal about the rights of Asian people. And I think this is very, this is so impactful for those people to outspoken, especially on whatever programs or on social medias, it's really, really powerful. And I can see like, for young children, for, the, for them to be able to see Asian people being representative in, represented in those media, I think it's just going to have a huge, huge impact for them to grow up and to be have more confident in them in terms of speaking up. And it, I, I'm hoping it's going to also change uh, this mainstream media too, right? And because uh, I, I think we, we have a powerful ways on the social media and as well as other ways. Like, we, if you want us to be your customer, right? You have to hire us, you have to listen to us, you have to advocate for us. And this is communication. I think this is what communicators do. And I have a, I know someone who works at, she's Asian, she works with ABC. And I was talking to her earlier and she was saying the, the reason, the exact reason she got hired is a group of Asian leaders approaching the ABC saying, we need to be represented. You need to hire someone so we can be represented. So that's how she got hired. So I think we need to do more like that. All of a AAPI groups and our supporters, our allies should do more advocating like that. And so we'll have more representation and we'll have better communication to the mainstream. It's not like so biased, like AAPI person do this in the main media. So one day I think we can change that. Hopefully. There's also there's also something to be said about recognizing what capitalism and white supremacism has done 
to minority groups. The fact that the model minority exists, it's because it stems out of white supremacy, because white supremacy rewards minority groups that do better than other minority groups. So in turn, we end up fighting each other. And why we do that, it's because of the goal of capitalism. So if you do better, then white supremacy says, well, you're, we pick you, and so you become more successful, and then you become reflected back onto other minority groups as somebody to either be you know, you, you can say celebrated or resented, but in most cases it's resented um, because it keeps all of us at one level and lets the, you know, that white supremacy continue and perpetuate. So I think that's a big thing that has to be recognized within communication um, and, and just in the job industry in general is like where in, and especially, you know, what we're talking about in DEI work, it's like, where do we battle the old system of white supremacy that keeps the model minority myth alive? You know, and it's not even between just Asian people, it's between Asian and Black and Latinx and, and everybody. Um, you know, so I was talking about this with someone today. It's like, whether well, we need to find a way, you know, obviously we need to fight Asian hate, but we have to find a way to communicate with each other across intercultural, intersectional boundaries, because that's the only way this system of white supremacism that keeps us in this place is going to be dismantled. Um, because if we keep having misconceptions about each other, not just within the AAPI community, but across borders with different cultural groups, you know, we're still going to be stuck in this, in this pattern. So, um, you know, there is something to be said about recognizing that specific piece of all of this too. Yeah, and I think you mentioned a really great point about intersectionality. Um, just like, you know, on this call, there's a duality to being an Asian woman and, well, to being Asian and a woman, you know, because all women face a certain set of problems in society compared to men. And then Asians face certain problems in society compared to other races. So just intersectionality is always at play. And it's not like you're experiencing being a woman and being Indian separately, like you're experiencing both of those things all the time. Um, I wondered if anyone else on the panel wanted to speak more towards intersectionality. Not to put everyone on the spot at the same time. No, I mean, I could even chime in a little bit on that of like to see intersectionality of how you like revolve around this. I think for so many things, it's like, I can't speak for everyone's perspective, but I know me, I'm always stuck in this multiracial thing where it's just like, where I'm living this duality, both ethnically and then culturally, because I'm in between two different cultures. And it's like, especially when things like this, you know, coming out, it's like, I'm not only in a battle with maybe my more white family or, you know, my, you know, the white community of how to go. I want to be at the table. I want to be here. I deserve to be here. But it's also because of some of these structures placed on, you know, the Filipino community, I also have to divert that energy into calling that out um, because we always have to question like who's benefiting from this? Um, we are not. Uh, and then someone who is stuck between this intersection and this duality more specifically, it's like, how do I feel like I'm always, I'm always in the middle and stuck between trying to figure out like what's the right thing to do? What's the right thing to call out? And, you know, then it goes into, you know, you're not this enough, you're not that enough. And it's not just for folks that, who are multiracial like me. There's a lot of folks, you know, they emigrated here and their kids are like, well, you look Filipino, you aren't Filipino though, because you're different from the people back at home. And that's something that like we're trying to navigate like all together, because like we deserve to be at the table there, but it also there's so many different things that go on. And that's from my perspective, um, you know, Sunny, you know, Prachi, Don, would you like, Don Michael, would you like to add to that? I, I think I share what you were saying. Um, I, as Asian, as woman, I definitely experiencing that at the same time. I cannot really distinguish uh, some some of my experience, whether because it's I'm a woman or, or whether I, I am an Asian. It, it's really hard to tell. And I don't really know, like, for example, that guy attacked me in New York. I don't really know if he attacked me because I'm Asian or because I'm woman, right? Because it, I just feel like they always goes hand in hand with each other. Um, and for example, if I'm spoken in a ballroom, um, people looking at me in a weird way because I spoke up, I, I don't know if they look at me thinking I should be so quiet, I shouldn't speak up because 
I'm a woman or because I am Asian or, or maybe or both. So I just feel like all, always those things goes hand to hand. And, and also as Alex was saying, I am always struggling trying to find the right balance because if i'm talking to people in the us some people are thinking oh you are not us right you are not us enough and if i talk to people back in china i still have a lot of contact right like oh you're like oh my god you become so americanized so i was just always struggling like what is the right balance like what should i do is, is it proper for me to act this way or that way and especially those kind of outspoken thing right just like People don't do that in, in China. It just like feel so strange. Um, and even my parents thinking like I, I told I was telling her, right? I'm spoken at the CUN, I was spoken at that Weijo, I was doing this and that. And they get really worried. They're like, why are you speaking at? Why well, like this? You just think quiet down, right? I don't we don't want you to be attacked by people and, and things like that. So yeah, I, I don't know. It's a it's a really mixed feeling of intersectionality between the Asian, between women, between different groups, and um, also I think this model minority thing or the implicit bias thing and all those things we were talking about. It's um, like Don Mike was saying. I I think this is them from the white supremacist, and it's really so they can be empowered by this white. They can be the most powerful group, and we all those minority and all those marginalized group we have to fight to be the better one so we can become the favored one by this white group so yeah so that's uh, that's why i feel like this this there's a great intersection attitude with that too yeah yeah that's definitely a good point i feel like even that's something my mom used to say to me when i was younger and i didn't get it back then but she was in india for about 25 years and then she's been over here for longer than that and she says when she goes back and forth when she's there she's like too american and then when she's here she's always seen as an outsider so it's like being a perpetual outsider yeah. basically exactly um don michael or prachi did you have anything you wanted to add to that yeah i could add something um it this what this brought up for me was this idea of like code switching so mm -hmm. like you know we are all so intersectional in that we all hold a lot of different like identities but then i'm also thinking about like from an asian american perspective or an indian american perspective like the way that i would speak to someone who is from a gujarati like my gujarati community growing up for instance is really different from the way i'm communicating like right now in a more like maybe professional setting versus like speaking to my friends and i'm just thinking about like how that translates to communication overall, right? Like when we're commuting, communicating to different communities also, like how are we mm -hmm. changing our language? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot that can be said there, like ways to make language more approachable perhaps, but also like not buying into stereotypes in, for communities. Like I think, for instance, I feel like I don't have a lot of conversations like this maybe with like, you know, like older, like Gujarati, like, aunties and uncles that I've grown up with, but maybe not taking that, like instead of just taking that at face value, maybe like pushing myself to have more conversations about like diversity and equity and like not thinking that those communities, like those people I've grown up with won't understand, you know, those things because maybe they will. And mm -hmm. I just have never given them the chance to, you know, have that conversation with me. So yeah, yeah. but it's always hard to know when to like broach that subject too. Totally. Because I mean, challenges subject to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I agree completely. Don Michael, did you want to add to that as well? Oh, sure. <laughs> I didn't know if the subject was changing or not, but um, yeah, I mean, it's. I think everybody's already said it needs to be said. It's. It's just we have to recognize beyond, um, you know, our own the, the things that we struggle with just in our own sector of the community, um, but th just the intersectionalism of one person, um, you know, and then you can even go beyond and include, include the LGBTQ plus um, key or part of that, you know, because that's a whole nother, um, you know, part of that struggle, um, because that's a, another different aspect to a person. And so even that topic within the AAPI community is very sensitive, um, where, you know, you, especially speaking for the Filipino um, culture, you get LGBTQ plus people 
tokenized in, in the way of like they're entertaining, but they're not respected as people. They're looked at as objects. They're looked at things in media that make you laugh or people that are like, you know, the butt of all the jokes, but you never see real stories about LGBTQ plus people in Filipino media. You're just now starting to see it, but it's on YouTube. Like it's not on like ABS, CBN, like the main, um, you know, groups that are the main channels in the country. Um, they're, they're the true real stories of LGBTQ plus people are forced out to the web, like the unofficial route, you know, to, to be out there, but they're out there, you know, it's just waiting for their traditional media, so to speak, to pick it up. So, um, you know, when it comes to fighting discrimination and hate, you know, you, it's that same question, like, are they coming after this person because they're brown or because they're a woman or because they're trans or because they're gay, you know, or, or all of those things, it's very hard to tell. But I think the more conversations we can all have with each other from other parts of different communities and different cultures, I think the more it'll be that kind of collective version of comparing notes, so to speak. And then that's how you can kind of bring it all back to fight that model minority because like when white supremacism come and comes and says like, well, let's butt you guys against each other. We can both say, well, we've re we, we've compared our notes and we can, we see you, we know what you're doing, you know? So, um, and then we can move forward, so. Yeah, thank you everyone, uh, you know, for, you know, your stories and your insight in this. And I agree, we need to push for more representation across the board. And, you know, I, I always say this too, you know, because people may push that, oh, this is a media narrative. You don't really feel this way. Um, but it's something that I feel we all have experienced since a young age, but now as an adult with social media and, you know, just being in the, the times that we're in, we finally have the voice to put to the feelings we had that started out when we were very young. And that's what's completely, you know, different that, uh, that then I guess in the past, because, you know, just this conversation alone, you could just, you could say that we're outspoken. Who knows if this same type of conversation would have been had on a platform like this, you no, know, like on like TV a decade ago, two decades ago, three decades ago. And that's, you know, especially with different people represented, we might have all just looked the same and wow, well, we're painted out as we're representative. But, even when we have these conversations, it's good to point out that we are also not representative of everyone within the communities that we, you know, are part of, because uh, there's so many of us. And, you know, I always hear this, you know, phrase, oh, what about diversity of thought? But you'll never have diversity of thought until you have diversity of people in the room. So that's just something that we have to navigate. And we're gonna open this up to like question and answers. We're gonna keep it towards, uh, you know, the chat. So definitely drop in a question. Uh, you know, if you would like to, we'd like to hear, you know, any questions you have. Um, but just quickly, you know, while we wait, see if we get any questions, I wanted to just briefly bring up real quick of um, something that we probably all experience is that uh, it's the perpetual foreigner syndrome. Um, and this is something that, uh, that we all have to deal with, like, what are you? Where are you really from? And questions like that, that we always kind of have to deal with, because I've had that. Like, where are you really from? And it's like, from down the street? Like, what do you want me to tell you? What are you? I'm like, well, are you like objectifying me? Like, what am I? Like, ask me, what is my ethnic background and things like that? Because um, people ask me all the time, especially because I'm quote unquote racially ambiguous. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it's like, oh, what are you? What's your, like, who, like stuff like that. And it's just like, why is that any of your business if this is not contextual to the conversation we're having? Um, and I know if, you know, quickly, um, you know, well, definitely we probably all have experience where I can't speak for, you know, everyone on behalf, but I do see we have a question. Uh, so I want to hurry up and get to that real quick. So to the panel, any recommendations or resources for how we can help support Asian American Pacific Islanders in the Pittsburgh area? Anyway, can jump I feel in. like I feel like one place to start is you know reaching out to if it exists um, a cultural association that you identify with, 
you know, that's one really great way to do it. Like, for example, for me and Alex, it's the Filipino American Association of Pittsburgh. You know, they were so lovely to endorse this event and to push it to our association. Um, you know, so if anyone had has attended today, they're at least hearing this message and learning about it. Um, that's a great place to start. So there are plenty of organizations in Pittsburgh that are, you know, you name it, like Chinese American, Indian American, South Asian, you know, Japanese American, and I even... Um, um, Nepalese American, like they're, they all exist. And um, I know there's somebody um, on this, uh, on this webinar right now, Theodora Shipper. Um, she's like the, the queen of Pittsburgh. She knows all of these groups. So I would say she is a good resource too. Sorry to call you out, Tita, but <laughs> Tita Teodi um, is a really, really awesome leader in the API community. And she has managed to help create a network between Asian leaders across the um, across um, cultural lines um, that culminates in a cultural day once a year. Um, so hopefully, fingers crossed, that might come back this year. But, um, you know, so really start there. I would say look for a group in Pittsburgh that you might identify with. And if you don't, there's there's a way to start your own group. You know, social media exists for that reason, too. You can find people within Pittsburgh that identify with you and, and start from there, you know. Otherwise, if you don't do that, it takes act. Um, active people to to do that to create those resources and obviously there's like the normal kind of routes that you could go to as well you know you can look up support groups in town and um, things like that but I know that PRSA PRSA has a whole thing that they're going to talk about so I will not go into that yeah I, mean, I, I would kind of add to that too a bit where it's like you know this these cultural groups in Pittsburgh but it doesn't necessarily just need to be the people who identify within that we always welcome other people to you know, show up. We we have we'll have a you know people of different backgrounds you know at our Filipino events, and that's great. And we invite that. And you know, it's the same for us. We especially when we have these like cross cultural like events, we're here, we're ready to go. Um, it, it, I think that's what's great. It's because we're both recognizing you know we might be of a minoritized status here, but we could still share culture together. We could share community, we could share space together. And, you know, we're better as a team as we are separate. So I think it's really great, this, uh, you know, just to see that. Um, and it's happening here in Pittsburgh. Not a lot of people know about that. Um, and it, it's really uh, the people who know about that stuff just happen to be people who identify with it. And not a lot of people say that because I've had a colleague say like, where, well, how do we hire diverse talent? Where are they at? And it's like, well, we've been here the whole time. Uh, <laughs> What do you want to do? Uh, you know, just look it up. There's always something going on. Some, you know, organization is doing an event and or doing it together, or there's a festival and there's always something going on. So when it comes to that, you know, finding stuff in Pittsburgh, we're here. Uh, it's just about how could we be here to highlight them, show up, share their events, be in support. And, you know, not just towards, it's not just us telling a certain community, you have to do this. Like even within the Asian Pacific Islander communities, we have to do the same. Like we have to be here at support for each other, for the black community, for the Latinx community and for so many other communities. And it's very important that, you know, not only that we, we wanna be at the table but we're bringing everybody to the table with us. So, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to point out from the chat, uh, John Palmer left a really good comment here. He said, I agree that we need to see more AAPI members in leadership, professions, and so forth, such as news anchor desks, political positions, the C-suite, teachers, and so forth. Um, working in the health industry from 2005 to 15, uh, the number of Asian and Pacific Islander direct care workers grew from 117,000 to 219,000, which was 88% growth. Um, and in 2015, they constituted 6% of the direct care workforce. So I just thought that was interesting you pointed that out. As an audience member, sharing all those stats is great. There you go. Yeah, that's awesome. So I just want to add something to the discussion. I think it's very important that um, as individual, right, we, stay, we stand in solidarity with each other, that like we support each other. So if you know any people in your group, in your work group or uh, private life, and that's APM members. So probably it would be great to, if you just reach out to the issues if you heard about this topic and post share share that on your social media that you care about those issues so those things can go viral and if you're in the position in your company or 
to support AAPA people who may be struggling with issues, like dealing with these middle minorities, be a sponsor, be a supporter. Um, really, I think sponsor is so important for their development, give them good assignment, give them opportunities, um, let them participate in board meetings, other meetings, and let them to speak out, right? I think that's so important. And that's, um, that's really excellent way you can participate and support AAPI groups. And, um, and we, we can always bring, a, if you also, also just like just thought about that, if, even within your company, within your group, probably have a one like this. You can bring people to share to your wider group within the company. Like this is those are issues that's going on and talk to the diversity and inclusion people. So they were more aware of those issues. So they would be more intentional when they are considering their worst inclusion to include AAPA representation, um, not talking to them, but actual representation to, to think about them. And also just to bring some human, um, humanity into these discussions. I, I, I generally like food. I generally like arts, like performance, things like that. So, so I think those things is really helpful to, um, for, for other people to see AAPA people as human beings, right? As, they are just not objects, they are not just numbers, but it's really helpful to um, use those messages to see people as human beings. And if I could chime in quickly, um, what that brings up for me also is I'm thinking about how generally, you know, just supporting like API businesses is a good way to just start generally, right? Like whether that's yeah. restaurants and Sunny, you just mentioned like the power of food, right? That's such a good connect, like a way to connect with people and a culture and understand where people come from. Um, but also like social media and just like following organizations that are doing work and platforms because there's I, like even in Pittsburgh, you know, there's organizations who are trying to like start conversations and usually are trying to engage with, you know, people in the broader community um, and are hosting events. Like I know for the for South Asians Building Bridges, we, we try to do like monthly chai and chat events that are open to the public where we just talk about an issue. Um, so yeah, I, I think by following organizations and platforms, you can find ways to engage and attend events and try food and you know hear music and understand the culture. Yeah, thank you everyone for your you know contributions. I mean, I would even push too like, even at the workplace, do you have like a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee task force? If not, like if you don't, are you not going to say anything about it? It's like time to speak up. And I even say, you know, because I've been seeing this a lot just from my experience. There's not a lot of men that you know, you know, are at the forefront of it. And men have to be here as well uh, because a lot of the structures in place have been placed by men, actually. And it's very important that we, you know, stand in solidarity, especially with our women, and then especially, you know, across so many different communities. Uh, I think it's extremely important. And, you know, I, I don't think it's, it should, a committee like that shouldn't be like us telling you what to do. It should be like, this is a group effort. We want you to be part of this because together in numbers, we can actually make these changes. And I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, definitely it is. Um, if there aren't any other, other questions, I think we're going to wrap this up, uh, but thank you all for attending. Um, follow our social channels at PRSA Pittsburgh or at PRSA PGH on Twitter and Instagram to find our blog post recapping this event. And thank you to all of our speakers for coming today and sharing your thoughts. Um, I'm so glad Alex found you and he found you guys really easily. So finding good Asian talent is not hard. We're here. We're here. Uh, yeah, I also want to plug in. We do have a PRSA Pittsburgh DNI toolkit that you could check out. We also have a DNI pledge that we definitely recommend. Uh, you know, signing. Uh, and if, when in terms of the Filipino American Association of Pittsburgh, we're on Facebook. Uh, come find us. We have some cultural events hopefully coming up soon. Uh, you know, since the pandemic happened, it's been kind of hard. We kind of done virtual to keep alive, but we're definitely ready to work with other organizations and be on the forefront of that. And, you know, while we're still here, like we have our panelists here, we definitely want to give them the space to, you know, uh, tell a little bit of what they're doing and some resources or some places you could go to. So I'll start out with Sunny. Hey, any like places you recommend uh, for what you do and things like that? 
I'd say a really good national resource that I'm an ambassador for is called Unapologetically Asian. Um, it's a really great place to start to see kind of on kind of on the media side, but they're trying to be as educational as possible in terms of information. But the way we started it was to get AAPI media personalities to shout out what was happening last year. Um, uh, related to that, but not their partner organizations, but racism is a virus um, is where unapologetically Asian stemmed from. So those two organizations are really great. Follow them on, on social media, on their website. Um, if you buy, um, if you buy, products from them, like their merchandise, it goes to support AAPI um, groups and or other organizations that fight um, Asian hate. Um, for me personally, you can find me on Instagram at Don Mike Mendoza. You can also follow my new podcast called Producing While Asian that launched this month, where I have conversations with different AAPI people within the producing space um, to kind of get their perspective on how they're not just surviving the pandemic, but you know how they're also joining the conversation um, on fighting tokenism and model minority and all of that good stuff. So um, again, that's Producing While Asian, or you can follow me personally, it's Don Mike Mendoza. Um, I can jump in. Yeah. So, yeah, I mentioned this a few times, but the organization I've been working um, on creating with a few other people in Pittsburgh, it's called South Asians Building Bridges. We're on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so you can, you know, see what we're doing. We're trying to host events, um, you know, every now and then. Um, and in, like a resource that just jumped into my head is an Instagram account called Brown History, which I found pretty like, I think it's been really great because it chronicles like how you know different stories of how South Asian people and have you know been a part of history and historical events in ways that often aren't talked about um like in textbooks you know um so I recommend giving that a follow if you can um and yeah you can find me at, on Twitter if you like Prachi Patel 101. So sure, and thank you for having me. And it's a great evening uh, discussing with everyone. So I, I just feel like fortunate to be here. In terms of resources, I'm very involved in the Asian American Bar Association of Pennsylvania, as well as involved in the National Asian American Bar Association. So we have put together many different kinds of hate crime resources, as well as ways of reporting in different languages. So, so if you are learned about that, just say, or if you need legal assistance, we're putting together pro bono representation for those experiencing hate incidents as well hate crimes. So you can fill out the form and someone in the AAP attorneys group will reach out to you and still help you as well, anything we, we can do. Um, in Pennsylvania, we're putting together like a, a victim reporting mechanism. Um, so in that way, we can have the concrete data of the heat incident happened within the Pennsylvania because we are trying to work with our state legislatures and putting a like, putting legislation in place to protect the AAPI people of the heat crimes. And so, uh, but in order to do that, we are trying to get the data in terms of what kind of incidents happened in Pennsylvania and how many things like that. Because right now, we don't have such data available. So we're trying to work on that and. Um, uh, so going forward, we'll have that kind of data. Um, so because we think that's important uh, in terms of the business side, and uh, I'm very involved in a number of Chinese Chamber of Commerce, as well as uh, United Chinese Americans and other associations. We are constantly putting together programs, uh, advocate, advocating for base, uh, diversity inclusion, advocating for cultural understanding, um, uh, and hopefully that's helpful to bridge the gaps of people and between different countries as well. Um, and I don't have Instagram, I don't have Twitter, but you have ability to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect and or, uh, continue this discussion with anyone. But um, if you want to follow up, you can connect with, for example, the La Papa National American Bus Association, as well as an, a Papa PA American Bus Association uh, of Pennsylvania. So they, they we always post our programs on that. So thank you so much for having me. Nice. Thank you everyone uh, for joining us in and everyone that, that just that came to listen along. Uh, just quickly, uh, I'll point out as well, uh, you know, Asians for Mental Health, you can follow on Instagram. It's by Dr. Jenny Wang. Uh, she's working on putting a scholarship fund uh, and a more well put together resource list uh, of mental health professionals across the country. I think it's very important for people within our communities to know that it's okay to not be okay. It's okay 
uh, a lot of times people, we don't speak about it. Uh, it's told, it's frowned upon within many of our communities. So definitely look out, a lot of people are suffering uh, within our communities and they don't feel like they can speak up and it's okay to speak up. So definitely want to throw that out there. Um, and for everything we just said, we're again, we're putting together a recap block of basic things that we, basically all the things that we said, um, good resources, um, additional resources, kind of way to find, you know, Sunny, Prachi, and Don Michael. Um, so yeah, uh, Mega, did you want to add anything before we close out? Um, yeah, I follow this Instagram account called Brown Girl Therapy, and I think that it's um, a very good account. And just all the other resources that were mentioned are great too. I started following um, Dr. Jenny Wang recently because you suggested her. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it. Thank you all for coming. Um, Taylor, do you have any closing remarks? No, just, um, yeah, thank you all for coming. And thanks to all of our panelists for speaking today and sharing your personal experiences. It was a really informative um, and inspiring conversation. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Taylor, for, you know, suggesting for this joint event, you know, the important conversation. That, and this conversation isn't, isn't over. Uh, you know, this is always an, you know, evergreen conversation that needs to be had across the board. So again, I want to thank, you know, Mega, of course, for co-moderating, Taylor, of course, for helping put this event together. And, you know, our three panelists, thank you so much for taking your time and having this important conversation. Uh, we're very grateful, for both organizations, that you're here with us speaking, and we're happy to give you voice as well. Uh, you know, we have to stick here and be here for each other. And I'm all about amplifying, you know, the voices within our communities, because we are strong, people need to know we're strong, and that's kind of where I'm at. And again, thank you everyone that was in the audience. Um, as we say in Tagalog, maraming salama sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much, everyone. And definitely be on the lookout for events uh, moving forward. So again, thank you so much. <laughs>